Today, we are excited to host two very influential scholars in the conservative movement. We have Professor Patrick Deneen, author of the critically acclaimed work, Why Liberalism Failed, and Mr. Timothy Gordon, author of Catholic Republic and co-host of the TNT podcast. Mr. Deneen and Mr. Gordon agree on much in their respective outlooks. They believe America and the Western world at large is fundamentally headed in the wrong direction, and their particular works explore the foundations of the present crisis in great depth. Whereas Professor Deneen's position may be described as more for foreboding, the Lockean tenets upon which American constitutional democracy was founded unalterably contain the seeds of its demise. Mr. Gordon believes there is room for regeneration, so long as we reclaim the true principles long since forgotten upon which true republics are founded. Today you'll hear each of these views articulated in greater detail, with some intervening dialogue in between and how they relate more broadly to the populist currents presently sweeping across America with the 2016 election of President Donald Trump and in Europe with Brexit and other political movements on the continent in countries like France, Italy, and Hungary. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us today. Glad to be here. Likewise, so, thank you. Thank you very much. So before we begin with our discussion, I'd like to identify two key quotes, one from each of your books, starting with Professor Deneen. Professor, in your book, you say that liberalism has failed not because it fell short, but because it was true to itself. It has failed because it has succeeded. For our listeners who may be unfamiliar with your work, could you please describe briefly what you mean by this really in one or two minutes? Sure. I'm shocked that some of your listeners might not be familiar with my book. So, uh, uh, the thesis—I mean, the thesis is that just as you laid out uh, that there are there, there are core principles within liberal philosophy uh, that, as they become realized in practice, actually end up undermining the preconditions for a healthy political society. Uh, and these preconditions are essentially—I uh, I really distill them to two. And the first of these is a. Uh, you know, deep-seated belief in sort of radical individual autonomy that has to be realized through the political uh, organization of society itself. So political organization in some ways comes to exist in order to undermine the preconditions for political society, that is to say, something that we find in common, ultimately some idea of the common good. Uh, and then the other pre and fundamental precondition is a, a, a kind of a deep antipathy toward, indeed, a hostility toward uh, nature as broadly conceived, both uh, we can think about in terms of environment, uh, the, the environmental degradation of the world as a condition of our liberty, as a condition of this radical autonomy. But of course, we can also think about it in terms of a kind of hostility to human nature. And this manifests itself especially in a deep-seated antipathy to, obviously, reproduction, the human biology, um, the fact of, you know, the, the fact of uh, complementarity of man and woman. Uh, so in many ways, you could say some of the deepest, most profound challenges that we see across the Western world today are not a result of insufficient realization of liberalism, but from the full realization of its deepest core principles uh, now realized in practice. Very well. And now, Mr. Gordon, you say throughout your work that America is a nation that is wired Catholic, labeled Protestant, and currently functioning as secular. Could you describe what you mean by this for our audience, again, in just a brief minute or two, summation? Certainly. Yeah, and for the record, my book is foreboding as well. I want that, <laughs> I want that out there. I don't want to be the optimistic guy. <laughs> no, um, why Catholic? labeled Protestant and currently uh, functioning secular, the demands of America's secretly Catholic wiring, uh, I call it crypto-Catholicism, um, necessarily ordered us, and, and all republics, properly properly wired republics, to uh, Aristotomism. And what I'll, what I'll make the argument about probably in questions three and four here today is that both strains of modernism, both halves of the coin, it came about in the 16th and 17th centuries. The, the Reformation, the philosophy that goes along with it, and the Enlightenment philosophy of the 17th, 18th centuries are both rejections of the natural law you know, or, or more easily construed Aristotomism. So insofar as America, which is a unique brand, a new brand of republicanism, um, 
is wired Aristotomist. It's it's wired in a way that's unique to Republicanism. Now, I, I say it's labeled Protestant simply because the citizenry of of the colonies turned republic were, were Protestants, mm-hmm. and they were a certain brand of Protestants. They were um, 18th century neo Whigs, the guys, the founders and framers, going around calling themselves neo Whigs, which was a recurrence to a principle in the 17th century, the Whigs in England, it was a parliamentary principle, that um, whether intentional or self-conscious or not, inherently invokes the idea of both the Protestant and the Enlightenment, both kind of both halves, it's a conspicuous mixture of that rejection of natural law, all while in the Declaration and in certain parts of the Constitution, the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendment, recurring to nothing but the natural law principle. So there's a schizophrenia um, between America's what I call Protestant Enlightenment principles and its Aristotomism, which is there really undergirding all the important passages of the Declaration and the Constitution. And so you have all of these Protestants in the, the colonies who are a conspicuous mixture of secularist and and reformation thinkers and and really the secularism is generation by generation swallowing the protestantism it's something theologically i would argue always happens with protestant christianity it's secularizing christianity so today it's currently functioning secular okay but but the argument the primary argument of the book which borrows from and absolutely emulates a lot of Dr. Deneen's premises is strictly with Dr. Deneen insofar as the conclusion that um, that the, the founding, the first principles of America were inherently either Protestant or, and or secular. That's where I take issue. I'm saying they're crypto Catholic and, and I can prove it even using case law. Okay. Um, yeah, that there was a change, so we're a gonna, profound change. We're going to hit on this topic in a second but first i want to begin you see many conservatives today identifying as classically liberal or post-liberal um we'll begin with maybe dr deneen here what do these terms mean to you do you believe it's possible for someone to truly identify or be a classical liberal as they think that um, label means in today's age in the modern age is it possible to be a 19th century liberal in 2019 America? Well, yeah, certainly uh, you see a lot, uh, at least philosophically, are, uh, are, I would say, prevalent in the conservative movement and especially in the conservative intellectual domain. Mm -hmm. I've just finished, I've just finished reviewing George Will's new book, uh, Mm -hmm. The Conservative Sensibility. And if you want, uh, you know, a really uh, very crystal clear distillation of a defense of classical liberalism in its 19th century form, you could you could uh, you couldn't do better than than George Will's book. And what's striking about his book, in many ways, is that it um, it combines two elements that I think you see inherent in the sort of inherent in the what I would say is the incoherence of the liberal project, which is on the one hand a belief in a kind of unchanging human nature, which is you know Will begins the book by arguing natural rights philosophy. Um, insists upon and indeed is based upon a view of human nature that is foundational, uh, that is given, that can't be changed or transformed, uh, and in this human nature inherit our natural rights, hence the, hence the word natural rights. Mm-hmm. And yet he describes this in the context of a society that will itself be radically dynamic and changing, that mm-hmm. in particular its economic order will be always transforming uh, the nature of society. Uh, and among other things, will lead to developments that can be, you know, fundamentally unexpected, unpredictable. Obviously, not only technological, scientific, uh, ones that we're seeing are actually pressing against the very idea that there is such a thing as a human nature. Right. Uh, uh, that are, in fact, uh, now increasingly challenging the, the idea that that there's a human nature. Mm-hmm. And perhaps most incoherently, Will ends his book by an ar- with an argument that there's actually nothing in the natural world that we can think about as unchanging. He actually ends with a fairly Darwinian understanding of nature as as fundamentally um, always transforming. Uh, in some ways, the natural world is itself a reflection of the dynamic economic regime that we create. 
So the ultimate incoherence, I think, that we see in liberalism itself is its ground on a theory of human nature that ultimately can't be sustained within a liberal regime and, and the, the practice of a liberal regime itself. So you have a lot of people who are committed to classical liberal philosophy, but in fact, in practice, uh, the society that they would ultimately like to see realized, it seems to me, will ultimately be a challenge to and, and even undermine uh, that idea of human nature. And to Mr. Gordon, what do those terms, classical liberalism and post-liberalism, mean to you? And more specifically, what, what does liberalism mean to you? Is this a coherent body of thought, in your opinion, that 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 um, traces itself back to Machiavelli and just sort of degenerated over time through Locke, through Hobbes, Rousseau, and then later on with Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche? Do you see this as a coherent narrative within um, Western philosophy? Well, I'm not sure exactly what, what liberalism is, um, but I know it deals in some wise with the concept of liberty. All of those thinkers, whether modern or postmodern, mm -hmm. fall into a category of thinker that, that will get it wrong because they, they are, they will necessarily get things, um, crossed up because they are borrowing either, Reformation, anti-natural law precepts, or um, Enlightenment, anti-natural law precepts. And the two halves of the coin, you know, in the modern church, we call it modernism. Um, both halves of the coin share us actually three premises with regard to the natural law. Those three premises are, uh, they, they regard the conspicuous view of nature as free and moral, mm -hmm. on one hand, as intelligible. Mm -hmm. And as teleological or goal driven, which is which is the view of Aristo Thomism um, and Aristotle sharpened and we say chastened by the best of the scholastic thinkers, namely Thomas Aquinas. So nature is free and moral. And, and that has to do with, like Dr. Deneen said, uh, human nature as well as, as created nature, intelligible, meaning that we can learn both of and about are both of, from, and about, let's say, our surroundings. And goal-driven, nature is a place that has a goal that discloses itself. Well, for, for variant, even opposed reasons, the Reformation and the Enlightenment, all the postmodern thinkers are responding to these two, by the way, the Reformation and the Enlightenment reject nature as free and moral. Mm -hmm. The Protestants do so because of Biblicism. The Enlightenment will do so because of um, natural... Uh, naturalistic determinism. Same thing with regard to nature as intelligible. Uh, uh, Sola Scriptura and on the other side, um, scientific determinism reject these. And and same pace, uh, the the goal drivenness of nature. The way this shakes out in politics. Let's let's fast forward to today's uh, uh, two poles of conservatism: the post liberals on the one hand and the classical liberals on the other hand. They're sitting around arguing about whether or not drag queens should have uh, should civically be allowed to have a reading hour at public libraries. The one side argues that they they cannot do this within the current legal regime and they shouldn't be able to. That's the, the classical liberals. The other side says that they they can't do this under the current regime, but they should be able to. Mm -hmm. This both sides get it wrong. They both misunderstand the genius of American federalism and um, the the duality that Dr. Deneen describes inherent within George Will's book does exist in a, a, a veritable iteration of itself. But I, I think like Dr. Deneen believes, Will and all of the ones favoring classical liberalism get it wrong. The post-liberals seem simply to be deficient in terms of their procedural understanding of what the Constitution requires. The genius of the American Constitution is in what we call imperium in imperio, what, what the founders at the Virginia Ratification Convention called imperium in imperio. They got this from, it's a very old yeah. term. Yeah, and there's it's, a, our next question is on the founders, and I want to get into that. But Dr. Deneen, do you have a response to that, that, that both classical liberals and post-liberals have it wrong? Well, I, I guess I'm a little puzzled, at what, and I didn't address the question about post-liberals. Mm -hmm. I'm a little curious about what you mean by that, um, because that's not what I understood. Mm -hmm. um, and what Mr. Gordon just 
responded, it's not what I understood you meant by post-liberal. Mm-hmm. By post-liberal, do you mean those, those in many ways, the critics of liberalism who are looking to a kind of post-liberal order? Mm-hmm. Was that, yes, was that yes. what you meant by yeah, that? Yeah, I'm talking about, um, I mean, politically manifested, I guess the extreme <coughs> view would be sort of an integralist regime. Right. That you're seeing yeah, that's what I assumed you meant. That's what I assumed you meant. Even seeing elements of that label used on people such as Tucker Carlson right. or Sora yeah. Amari. Right, right. So, um, yeah, as I understand it, uh, post the this post liberalism, however we want to we yeah, want to describe it, whatever, yeah, yeah, is an effort is an effort exactly to think to think uh, to begin to think of what a a political order uh, would would look like, what would be its form, what would be its its uh, um, its internal composition and its deepest commitments mm-hmm. uh, that would not draw from either of what I see as the two sides of liberalism, which is its classic liberal expression, what we think of today as kind of the traditional conservative view, George Will being a good stand in here, uh, or progressive liberalism, mm-hmm. uh, which is really a kind of, you know, in some respects, it sees itself as, as, the, uh, as the antagonist of classical liberalism, but in many ways, it's classical liberalism on steroids. Mm-hmm. It's really, an, it's kind of accelerated version of this idea of radical autonomy. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, at the same time, you know, uh, uh, obviously seeing radical autonomy as re- as requiring an expansive and very activist state. Um, so the debate tends to be what's the best means to achieve autonomy? Is it with a relatively modest state or a relatively robust state? And the, and the argument tends to be over the relative place of the market and the state. Uh, I think among the the movement that you're describing as as post liberal, it's, it's an effort to rethink the terms of liberalism, which is what is the role of the state in the pursuit of the common good. Uh, that is to say, the debate isn't over whether the state should be minimalist in in preserving autonomy or maximalist in creating autonomy. Rather, what is the role of the state in cultivating and fostering the common good? Uh, and I think here, you know. You, you look back to figures like Aristotle and Aquinas as articulating precisely um, how the, the state as the, uh, the locus of our shared political life is the appropriate uh, space for, for that kind of discussion. Mm-hmm. And thus those who are, I think, uh, who would maybe go by the label of post-liberal or illiberal, I think is a sort of negative term yeah. for many, yeah. um, are, are, are especially interested in moving beyond the kind of liberal debate right, between right. left and right liberalism and beginning to think of ways in which not only our moral social order, uh, thinking about things like pornography, mm-hmm. abortion, and so forth, mm-hmm. but also our economic order have right. to be themselves ordered to the common good. Right. And this is a departure from both liberalisms that we've seen regnant over the last 50 years. Yeah, here we're, we're, I want Mr. Gorn to respond, but here we're kind of drifting into political terms. But first I want to address the philosophical foundations of this. And would you say in terms of, do you, your, your thesis, does it ultimately, is it contingent upon a Straussian um, view of liberalism? Uh, Doctor, Who, whose uh, thesis? Doctor uh, Deneen, is is your view of liberalism um, based uh, on sort of Straussian theory? Is basically what I'm asking. Um, I mean, Strauss is helpful mm-hmm. in in certain respects mm-hmm. in identifying transformations in political philosophy, yeah. uh, and I think especially his his analysis of the origins and the deeper philosophic currents that give rise to the, what he calls the first wave of modernity, which he regards as the yeah. sort of the philosophical parent of the liberal political order. I think, I think Strauss is helpful uh, in that regard, but I think, I, you know, I would point to a, a large number of thinkers that I think are helpful in that regard, right. including a large number of Catholic thinkers, even secular thinkers. Um, so it's not just Strauss who identified this, um, yeah, but Strauss right, is right. certainly helpful. Right. So, Mr. Gordon, do you understand modernity in sort of three waves beginning, as I said, said earlier, with Machiavelli continuing, you know, advancing further with more radicalized forms of uh, ideas of, of self-preservation that you see with Hegel and then advancing into sort of the nihilistic decay of Nietzsche, Heidegger, so on and so forth? Not at all. Not at all. We probably located the um, 
locus in quo of where yeah. with all our uh, uh, agreement, endemic agreement, I probably disagree with uh, Dr. Deneen. I, I locate Strauss, uh, Leo Strauss, as, again, the, the source and summit of where American conservatism misunderstands itself. Strauss, Strauss is nothing but a bad guy, in my view. There's a reason that in the, the faithful Catholic philosophy departments, no one wants to touch this guy. So you sort of end up with the assumption that all, you know, politics, politicking, I, I don't want to get too into Strauss, but you wind up with the assumption that all politics is rote and sort of crass and, you know, power um, seeking to aggrandize itself. And you look at the, the top line, the beginnings are that, well, Strauss didn't believe in metaphysics. I, I mean, and, and of course, the variant forms of Strauss, well, Straussians will always say, He's, he's speaking to me esoterically, secretly, and maybe he did. But Strauss, taken for Strauss, doesn't believe in metaphysics. He, he reads all of Plato, all of Aristotle as essentially glorified politics. Um, this is wrong, wrong, wrong. We could um, – yeah, Aristotle was listed by um, Thomas Jefferson, just for one example, as one of the four most important influences in America. I think Cicero was also on the list. That's a codified way of saying – Thomas Aquinas, uh, Algernon Sidney, one of the Whigs, the Whig of choice before John Locke, was actually accused during his life of ripping off um, Robert Bellarmine, and and he had to respond to this. That's all very abstruse because once we're here, here's I think the the point of departure. When we discuss liberty and we set it on the shelf and analyze it, since liberty is either ordered, which is proper, mm -hmm. and Dr. Deneen and I would approve of it or not ordered towards anything other than aggrandizing more of itself that's disordered liberty and neither of us would approve of it. We don't really know just by setting it on the shelf. Instead, how I respond to both the post-liberals on one side, the, the integralists and, and their ilk, and on the other side, the classical liberals, who are the, the sons of Locke and Sidney, who are just uh, you know, plagi Catholic plagiarizing, um, schizophrenic, really neo Thomas, they just wouldn't admit it. What I say is look at what the Constitution requires. Mm -hmm. Look at federalism within the Constitution. The, the genius of the system, I adverted to it before without unpacking it, is that it's, it's beautiful. Everything in both the Bill of Rights and the first three articles of the U.S. Constitution has two regimes, a faraway federal regime, which is explicitly disallowed from doing things like really uh, procedurally regulating substance or morals. They can't do anything moralish. But the close, the state level and the local level, and this is the heart of the issue, the state level is absolutely encouraged to do so. Um, for example, the Bill of Rights until the Civil War, which is really where things started going extra wrong, the, the Bill of Rights only constrained the federal government. It didn't constrain the state's government. For an instance, um, to the integralists, this isn't I believe, doctor, inclusive of Dr. Deneen, they want uh, uh, some sort of integrated church as state. Well, we had that in a Protestant form. I think eight of the 13 original states had an official establishment of state religion. This is only overturned in the middle 1900s. So it's very, very important to say and very, I think, demonstrable to make the claim that what started out is say something like the First Amendment was started out as the Tenth Amendment. Or, or the first three articles of the U.S. Constitution, which was really specific, that faraway government should not be regulating moralish issues, but local government should, kind of the best of both worlds. This all changed, but it was not originally wired to be that way. That's yeah. the, the genius. Um, certain thinkers identify a conservative tradition in American history, an Anglo-American conservative tradition, traditionally drawing its lineage through the Federalists of the American founding, through Washington, Adams, Hamilton, um, which ultimately became superseded at some point by a predominant liberal tradition, which became essentially um, uh, all, ex which became the only um, tradition by, you know, after World War I, many people say, some say the Civil War. Um, Yoram Hazoni, wrote an article recently for First Things Magazine 
called Conservative Democracy, in which he outlined five key principles of the Anglo-American conservative tradition, historical empiricism, nationalism, religion, limited executive power, and individual freedoms. Uh, to Professor Deneen, first, do you have any thoughts on what Mr. Gordon just said, and do you believe there was a Republican tradition based on Aristotelian principles, separate and apart from liberalism, that animated civic life and public morality for at least some part of American history? Yeah, I think, um, I think in many ways we're, we, we share a certain view of the, uh, uh, the, the way in which the Constitution functioned mm -hmm. for um, a significant period of time in American history. And, you know, Mr. Gordon's right that the, um, uh, the First Amendment, for example, was written precisely not to separate church and state, but in fact to protect what were then state establishments. And it's correct, eight of the, eight of the 13 colonies had established churches. Um, but it should also be pointed out that long before uh, the Supreme Court rulings in the mid 20th century that were alluded to, all of these states had actually already disaffiliated or dis disassociated uh, with their religious traditions. So you could say that there was already a liberalizing movement that had taken place well before the Supreme Court ratifies what had already become the de facto separation of church and state in all of the states. Mm -hmm. And uh, what had also become de facto the nationalization of you know, so much of American life, such that, that the federal government became, again, de facto, uh, sort of the governor, not only of, broadly speaking, the economic realm, but increasingly of the moral realm. So I, I while I understand that there's, um, there's a lot of debate, and I'm certainly a part of that debate, I take part in that debate, over where the kind of corruption comes in, um, my argument would be that, in fact, America was at best a kind of mixed founding. Uh, you have elements of the American founding that are very sort of almost radically liberal. And although Thomas Jefferson was just alluded to as perhaps drawing in a classical tradition, Jefferson himself uh, stated that the three authors he regarded as most important uh, were um, John Locke, um, Francis Bacon, and, and, uh, um, and Isaac Newton. So modern science, modern political philosophy uh, were the two, the two domains that he thought of as, as most foundational. And so he was, a, in many ways, a kind of much more radical modernist than someone like a John Adams, who was much more steeped in the classical tradition. So I, I guess my, my, my argument would boil down to, I think America, in many ways, was, um, um, let's say, inherited in practice a kind of pre-liberal, pre-modern set of traditions mm -hmm. amid... A, a fairly modernist philosophical and political structure uh, that was, you could say, existed in tension for a period of time. And I think, uh, you know, my, one of my favorite political thinkers, Alexis de Tocqueville, recognizes this when he comes to America in the 18, you know, late 1820s, 1830. He recognizes that there's this deep tension. He says there is this kind of traditionalism there. He points to, for example, the law as a place where you'll find a kind of conservatism, a kind of traditionalism, precisely because the law is understood as the common law tradition. It's based upon an idea of tradition and the kind of the slow sedimentation of decisions in which a society sort of forms itself. But he also recognizes a kind of radical side to America. Uh, that is this, again, this kind of desire for radical autonomy and individualism, which he thinks will lead to the nationalization of all kind of uh, the, the, the increasing centralization of, of the federal government, uh, not because of, um, uh, you know, uh, not because the, the people themselves um, ultimately were, so let's say, corrupted in some ways, but because the trajectory of the regime itself mm -hmm. uh, would lead them increasingly to require the federal government to support them in their individuation, in their radical autonomy. Mm -hmm. And so he describes the rise of democratic despotism arising from individualism itself. So I, I think it's, you know, we can contest over what is the source of the kind of corruption of the American regime. I think in many ways it was there at the outset, but it took a long time for its sort of official philosophic premises to work their way out into the practice uh, of, of everyday American life. Mm -hmm. We thank you for joining us today on Right on Point. Before we continue with the second half of our show, we hope we've sparked your interest to visit our website, rightonpointpodcast.com, where you can listen to previous episodes and interviews, 
contact us and learn more about the program. As you scroll down our homepage, please consider making a contribution to our show. There are options to either make a one-time payment or to become a monthly donor through Patreon or PayPal. Both options are equally appreciated. Even a small one-time contribution goes a long way. Right On Point runs exclusively off of your generosity. Each payment helps our podcast remain on all your favorite platforms, wherever podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, and many more. And as we increasingly integrate more video into your Right On Point experience on YouTube, viewers will be able to see up close and personal our spectacular and unrivaled guest lineup which includes some of the most influential names in politics today. Lastly, please subscribe to Right on Point on the platform you are currently listening to us so that you never miss an episode. We especially appreciate new subscribers on YouTube and iTunes. Thank you again for all of your support. We are absolutely committed to delivering our growing and devoted fan base the best experience possible. And now on to the second half of our show. And to Mr. Gordon, I want you to respond to that. Um, maybe perhaps starting with how you see that Madison misinterpreted Montesquieu, as well as do you think it's fair to categorize the American founding as liberal, Republican, or some hybrid? Well, Dr. Deneen and I share uh, a view of, of Madison uh, in, in large or in, in entire part. Um, so I should start by saying that Madison in, I, I don't know if he misinterpreted Montesquieu. I think he interpreted Montesquieu perfectly. He, for, well, I'll start out by answering the second part of the question. He, he characterized accurately some of the tension that Dr. Neen, Dr. Deneen just described in, I forget if it's Federalist uh, 51 or 73 or, or both, where he talked about a, a, a mixture in the regime and everything about the American Constitution, which I'd, I'd like to talk a lot more about, mm -hmm. the requirements of the Constitution, was mixed, right? It's a mixture of what we call procedure, which is changing, and substance, which is unchanging. Even that mixture of the changing and unchanging is um, Aristotelmist, mm -hmm. by the way. But we have procedural due process and, and substantive due process in the 5th and 14th. Uh, amendments, some of which can change, some of which can't. Uh, Madison also characterized the regime, whether or not liberal or Republican, as a mixture. He said it's partly confederated, partly consolidated. Consolidated means national government. The confederated part means the state governments. Where, where Madison was particularly dishonest, even sneaky, and, and I, I do favor what Dr. Deneen says about this against when, when he debated um, in friendly terms. My, my friend Robert Riley, I, I told Mr. Riley this, I, I believe Deneen's premises are correct. I believe your conclusion is correct. Madison, in look at famous Federalist 10, you know, you read it in seventh or eighth grade in some schools where he is he is saying um, when, when dealing with faction, which is like the Hobbesian component that, that Straussians fear America might turn out to, to be uh, uh, founded just in Hobbesian terms. He's saying that one can either uh, um, remove the cause of faction or control the effects. Mm -hmm. And Madison thoroughgoingly favors controlling the effects of faction. This is what I would characterize, and you see it in the Constitution, as a modernist solution. To the problem, um, whereas the anti-federalists, who are most of Madison's Virginian friends, guys like George Mason, Patrick Henry, um, one of one of the Lee brothers, are on the opposite end of this. And what they want to do is to favor the Aristotelmist Montesquieuan tradition. There's a direct lineage there, which, which says no, real republics have these three properties: the properties of they must be small. Geographically, if you want small scope of government, you got to have small scope of land. They must be uh, uh, one voiced in terms of morals and religion. They must have a, a univocity. They can't be pluralistic. And, and the three uh, branches of government must be rivalrous with regard to one another. Well, in Federalist 10, Madison uh, sort of unapologetically is – while at the same time he's saying, oh, Montesquieu, Montesquieu, everyone was saying him he was all the rage with both the anti-federalists and the federalists. He is really overturning Montesquieu's big rule here that republics must be small. And it's an age old rule seen in all historic republics, Venice and the Swiss cantons. Um, 
must be small. No, he wants a large republic, and it must be univocal. No, he wants he wants uh, pluralism, and that's where you get this treatment of competing factions. Mm-hmm. He uh, ends up offering this paltry um, expedient for the problem of factions. He just says more faction. You get enough factions, and it'll drown out the voice. I agree 100% with Dr. Deneen that this is a modernist uh ineffective solution it was set in place by the father of the constitution simply to overcome the anti-federalists who are screaming against this on the other side and montesquieu saying no we need a more confederated government we need something much more like the articles of confederation maybe halfway between the articles of confederation which which left the 13 states more like 13 countries with sovereign international immunity principles dealing with each other like wartime treaty powers um, or maybe something halfway between the the proposed constitution being ratified in Virginia from June 3rd to June 24th, 1788, um, and and the articles that they were really kind of sneakily moving away from to an over energetic government. I, I I don't I don't see any other view of Madison, who I I very much like, as as accurate. And again, a lot of a lot of Straussians will say, oh, Madison's a lot of constitutionalist heroes, too, because there is this genius involved by the two levels of government, state and federal. Mm-hmm. But he, he's going about state and federal government, which could be very potent at preserving our liberties in precisely the way it promised it would, uh, in a sneaky, underhanded way that, that cedes too much to federal government. That germ was probably there from the beginning, right. but it, it needed not be. Right. So n- now let's fast forward to 2019, modern Western civilization, where obviously all across the West, you're seeing it in Europe, a reaction against globalism. But you you also see rising secularism, a continued onward march of st- secularism, which has not curtailed or hasn't stopped since at least the 1960s. Um, must a modern regime, and you're seeing many integralists, we brought up integralists before on this show, um, saying that we need to now, we're in exceptional times, technology, modern communication, everything that we have today means that we have to rethink these principles of small r republicanism and now use state authority to promote the common good. We need to define what the common good is for the people and and use state power to 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 work towards that end um i'd like to get your thoughts on that dr denine it may not necessarily be a moral political um procedure you you're seeing it with economics such as protectionism breaking up big tech securing the border um you, you know and and maybe even tucker carlson talks about with automated uh, vehicle with self-driving cars, you may want to put a ban on that in order to ensure that the whole truck driving industry is preserved um, to allow these people time to either adjust to a new uh, to a new field or or just preserve that field altogether. So, what are your thoughts on that, Dr. Denis? Sure. Well, it, you know, what's striking is that. Um, we're seeing a really interesting inversion, which is the position that was once held in the 19th century mm-hmm. by progressive liberals is being defended today in the 21st century by conservatives. Mm-hmm. 19th century liberals were the nationalists. Mm-hmm. Uh, these were figures like Herbert Crowley and Woodrow Wilson and uh, um, uh, a variety of uh, John Dewey, who especially were, you know, to go back to what was just said, mm-hmm. were arguing especially against what they saw as the parochialism and the conservatism and backwardness of the states and localities and urging for a national self-understanding that people should no longer primarily identify with their localities, their regions, their states, that they should identify primarily uh, with the nation. Mm -hmm. In the 19th century, the Pledge of Allegiance was introduced by a Christian socialist, uh, uh, the brother of um, uh, France. his name was Francis Bellamy. He was the brother of Edward Bellamy, who were uh, who had wrote the most utopian uh, nationalist book, uh, one of the most popular books in the 19th century, called uh, Looking Backward. Uh, 
So we, we tend to forget that the position today that's held by so-called conservatives is occupying a position that was abandoned by so-called progressives today. Uh, they're defending a space that was vacated in what you could say is the logic of liberalism itself, which is that liberalism will move from you know, perhaps a more confederated understanding at the beginning of the American regime to one that will say there can't be boundaries or borders between people internally, right? We have to eliminate all, all sense of not only actual borders, physical borders, but any notional boundaries that might exist between people uh, that, I, that they might identify primarily as someone from Virginia or Connecticut or Michigan, uh, that they have to become increasingly identifying as Americans, as pe people who are part of the nation. And, and there was a concerted effort to transform uh, this view. Today, what's striking is that liberalism now moves to a position in which any borders across nations are illegitimate. Mm -hmm. There should be no boundary that should separate people uh, from one country and another country in the same way that this was true in the 19th century regarding Virginia and Connecticut, for example. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we just heard yesterday, you know, uh, AOC arguing that to defend boundaries or borders is essentially fascist. I mean, this is a striking position that we're in today. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I think we need to see is that we're, we're still, in an interesting way, we're still in some ways engaged in a debate that seems to me to be somewhat still within the boundaries of a liberal self-understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that said, the defense of the nation has potential of pushing us to a post liberal understanding if the understanding of the nation is infused with an understanding that the nation is a locus for the pursuit of the common good, but that the common good, I think to go back to something Mr. Gordon was saying earlier, the common good is best achieved in relatively more local uh, spaces and circumstances, that the nation can be the container in which those local spaces, in which those local circumstances can flourish. But if the position of today's conservatives is that we're just going to defend the nation, then we should say that they're actually defending the position that Herbert Crowley and Woodrow Wilson and John Dewey and others were defending in the 19th century. And I don't know if that's where conservatives should actually be. Mm -hmm. Can I respond yes. to that? Yeah, yes. I, I don't want to falsely impute to Dr. Deneen something he didn't mean to say, because I think there's at least a 40 percent chance he didn't mean to. But but uh, respond to this, um, if you would, please, Dr. Deneen, there, there's a utterly meaningful distinction between localism, which is constitutive uh, uh, in the aggregate of right-minded nationalism, right? Just all the local uh, interests aggregated are what we call nationalism in the right-minded sense, um, and identity politics. Uh, the, the, the strong way of putting the reason that localism is good is because out of the Catholic tradition, there's a term for it and a concept for it called subsidiarity. And it, th I think this might be where we disagree. Subsidiarity is always good. It always in, imputes a kind of um, um, good motivation to liberty. But it, uh, subsidiarity is always the Fed looking at state or local authorities, who was existing even in the Roman Empire, and um, assuming the best assumptions. Okay, with, with these localities, with their um, individual powers, let's assume that they're pursuing freedom for the right reasons. That's always inherent in subsidiarity, as described by Popes Pius and actually the Piuses, and even Pope Leo, who pre-existed the, the term but not the concept. Localism is inherently good, I would say, and um, even inherently Catholic. It's something that can't be conceived out you know, within the Protestant or Enlightenment tradition, even though it's so large in the Constitution, which is why I say the Constitution is more than a small share crypto-Catholic. Whereas identity politics, the other side of the coin, I don't think you're going to disagree with this at all, have always centered around the lionizing of vice. If you look at any identity politicking, it always centers around taking something that's either illicit, legally or morally, and making it okay based upon some shared conception of, of some accidental property like skin color or, or sex or whatever, sexual preference. So both seem to be local-ish, and I understand the, the grouping together of the concept as compared to the early 20th century Herbert Crowley types. But there's a meaningful distinction. I, I, I'm just curious what you would think of what, what how you would respond. Sure. 
Well, I, I'm, so I agree completely that subsidiarity is the, you know, obviously I think the, the, the standard exactly that I'm appealing to. Of course, what we should note is that subsidiarity is not the same as localism. It's simply an argument that uh, any issue that arises, especially in the context of politics or social uh, or the social order, there should be a preference given to solving or addressing that issue at the most local level possible, because it's at that level that people are most likely to have the sufficient um, commitment and knowledge, uh, the capacity to understand the specific circumstances. Uh, the application of the natural law has to take into account specific uh, prudential considerations that are going to vary from place to place and time to time, so that there should be a preference given to more local solutions. But it doesn't mean that it always will be at a local level, that there are times and places where you will need to move up to more, let's say, more distant levels uh, of government and society to, to address certain issues. We could say, for example, you know, certain environmental issues, overfishing of seas and so forth, or climate change and so forth. These are obviously global in form. This is not to say they can't have forms in which they can be addressed locally, uh, but should necessarily be addressed uh, at, at, at the most local level in which those can be sufficiently addressed. I, I'm, I'm interested and a little puzzled about your invocation of identity politics, which I don't see as having a strong endorsement or affiliation with an idea of subsidiarity at all. In fact, I think it is deeply affiliated with a kind of globalist ethos. And in fact, if you notice what, it might be the, the case that it's about vice, although I don't think so. I mean, I think there's identity politics that arises out of, especially out of African-American experience, and that a lot of different movements are trying to attach themselves to the moral, um, the, the kind of the moral essence of what that movement represented, the, the, the deeply moral movement of the civil rights movement. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's simply vice, but I, but I think the way in which identity politics has developed is that it is a way to identify a sense of self and belonging that is actually not located in any specific place or space, mm -hmm. and why there's a strong affiliation for the kind of globalist ethos I think you see uh, in, the, in the identity politics movements. Can I respond to a couple of those Just points? Maybe like yeah. one minute response because sure. I, I don't want to. Yeah, first, yeah, I'll bit. just give one one sentence bursts here. Uh, uh, Pope Pius XI describes subsidiarity more robustly as absolutely immoral for any higher order of any kind of governor, mm -hmm. whether it's um, actual government or just the family of the church, to do any kind of generic thing that can be done at a more local level. So it's it's always wrong to do it if generically can be done at the lower level. I equate this with localism, not because either subsidiarity or localism always requires the local government to do every governing function. Of course not. They always require local government to perform the governing function when it's capable of doing so. And it's a stronger requirement than today's purveyors of subsidiarity in today's church. I say, doesn't I say with a laugh, um, would characterize subsidiarity. Uh, the reason that I, I um, identified the telos, the teleology of identity politics with uh, the lionization of a vice is because um, the, the civil rights movement, had it been gone about the right way, sure, it would have been uh, morally laudable, morally praiseworthy, but it wasn't gone about the right way. It was gone about the anti-subsidiarian way, and therefore it's associated with the creation of the welfare state which is the, the uh, enshrining of nothing but that which all but destroyed America's black community, right? I mean, if you look at the out of wedlock birth rates and all that, the welfare state, which is synonymous with it, destroyed it. And same, it's always about either welfare or sex, something. That, that's what I always, if you go through any identity politic, it's sort of a side issue. I could show you, it's, it's always synonymous with some sort of vice. Mm -hmm. and, and that's because I believe uh, in grassroots solutions to moral problems. And now to uh, Professor Deneen and then Mr. Gordon can respond. Is America now in a state of decline and are governments based on avoiding the excesses of human nature as opposed to organizing around the common good for its citizens necessarily foredoomed to become decadent and rapidly decay? And to the first question again, how severe is this current decline of America, if you believe it is in a state of decline? Well, I think there are a lot of reasons to think that America is in a kind of state of decline. Uh, we could say this, uh, I think, certainly as a moral issue. 
Um, we could look to the degradation of the family, um, uh, you know, the official, the official permission and indeed encouragement of uh, the abortion as a, as a norm in American society. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we can look at, you know, you'll see measurements of wealth as a standard of progress. But, you know, I think you can also see it as in some ways a kind of standard of, of corruption, uh, especially when that wealth is highly associated with consumerism and, and high levels of debt which I think is a hallmark of American contemporary American society. Mm-hmm. So by every measurement of classical Republican theory, you know, going back to something that was discussed earlier, by every measurement of classical Republican theory, America is in a, is in a process of decaying. And, and classical Republican theory held the view that every regime is likely to undergo a process of sort of growth, um, maturity, and eventually a kind of decay of corruption. Uh, to use the, the term of art, the, the corruption uh, that's both it's kind of, you could say, the decay of a almost a biological creature uh, that 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 uh, that we experience as we age, but also the corruption of morals and manners and so forth. Um, at the same time, um, I think that that human beings are free, and we're not we're not necessarily destined to the conditions that have led to this decay, and we can take steps to attempt to um, at least arrest, if not reverse, uh, those conditions. Uh, it seems to me that one of the great um, barriers to the recognition of decay is that so many people today see those conditions not as corruption and decay, but as progress and as forms of liberation. Right. Uh, so the, the great obstacle to recognize the possibility that this is decay and corruption and even arrest or, or reverse that is the incapacity of an increasingly corrupt populace to recognize the nature of the very things that they are celebrating. And Mr. Gordon, to that question, and that'll be our second to last question right there. We spoke in earlier conversations that you said really the solution now to modern America is almost breaking it apart. Is that something that you would maintain? Certainly, with with the assumption that I, I agree with uh, virtually everything Dr. Deneen just said, I would stipulate this one small fact Um the moral degradation in America is accruable and was executed by the Protestant Enlightenment culture of America, the, the, the modernist culture, the, the people. And it was aided by the state um, mm-hmm. in aggrandizing its own power. Mm-hmm. Things like federalism breaking down um, was th- – this served to aid the process of secular Christianity, i.e. Protestantism, becoming more secular. But this happens on its own culturally especially the Whig form of Protestantism that, that governed early America. The, the solution, because this process has always, I, I believe, very accurately been likened to a so-called ratcheting effect. We say in the law, it's a ratcheting effect that only goes one way, the, the development of an entitlement state um, and, and all of the vice that it hastens and all of the uh, subsidiarity that it kills. Um, because of this, once you have a continent-sized republic, which we do, which is a contradiction in terms in the first place, you need to break it up. You simply need to break it up and, and the, the sizable pieces of that continent, maybe say even the state of Texas, is too large. This is, this is really central to, I think, all of these issues. Even the state of Texas is too large to be a republic by the classical standards. Mm -hmm. Because of the genius of American federalism, maybe you could get away with a, say, Virginia state-sized republic because of the way that then you'd break Virginia into 20 small states and then you'd have the imperium in imperial federalism, which would enable a a slightly larger Mm -hmm. uh, republic to function. But it's the only way to preserve all of these competing factions. Madison's uh, expedient does, did not work in Federalist 10. And furthermore, Thomas Jefferson as president, libertine though he may have been, he was an anti-Federalist, uh, mostly in his sensibilities. Most of his friends were anti-Federalists. And they were saying, look, the American Republic does not need to be one. It could be four uh, um, or it could be even remain 13 small republics. And this is the only way once, you know, because of the ratchet effect, the the subsidiarity, the natural rights have been given up. This is the only way to get it back and to enable 
subsidiarity to rule. Jefferson wrote this as president all throughout 1803 and 1804. He said, the future issue of American happiness does not depend on unity. We're all We've all been brainwashed by the outcome of the Civil War and, and this Straussian Lincolnianism that we always need to have one giant, self-contradicting, uh, continent-sized republic. There is no such thing. If there is one flaw at the beginning of the republic, I disagree with Dr. Deneen that there were others because of crypto-Catholicism, but if, if there's one flaw, it was the idea of having a large republic. It's a contradiction in terms. I saw you recently tweet that this would have been something unthinkable um, that you might would have endorsed, you know, a couple of years ago. But now it's gotten so bad on college campuses. Um, the, the liberal arts are basically it's certainly not in its classical form at all. Um, certainly far from it with identity politics, politics, so on and so forth. So would you do away with the humanities and higher education? Have we got to that point? Well, you know, I think that um, uh, when, it, when I tweeted that, uh, yeah, I was at a little bit of a fit of peak. Uh, um, uh, look, I, I think there are a variety of institutions around the country uh, that do certain things well and certain things not very well. And I think there are a lot of institutions that actually do humanities fairly well. So I, I wouldn't support sort of this wholesale, let's just yeah. you know, create a federal law to eliminate all humanities. Um, but it does seem to me that, uh, and I think one of the things that's interesting that worth watching, is that in a number of states, to speaking of subsidiarity, the number of states which which do fund uh, their their state university systems, there's a growing interest among legislators about what is the, you know, what is the contribution, particularly of the humanities and the liberal arts, uh, to the common wheel of those uh, of those states of those localities. Mm -hmm. And where the humanities, often in state universities, where they're often uh, organized directly, in some ways you could say, in confrontation to the sort of, let's say, the everyday views of the average citizen in which they are, those, uh, the faculty and the way in which those disciplines are undertaken are actually hostile to the, the basic underpinnings and beliefs of the broad citizenry of those, of those places, I think there's a, there's a legitimate question to be raised of whether or not the state legislature should continue to support uh, the, the funding of those programs. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that, that those institutions were founded and created by the states in order to play some role of benefiting those states. And the humanities and liberal arts in particular were created and funded uh, in significant part to foster a sense of what genuine liberality is, what is what is freedom, what is constitutive of freedom, mm -hmm. and here the kind of transmission of culture, the transmission of a, of a tradition, uh, the the, um, the cultivation of certain virtues and 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 certain kind of a character were right. central to the understanding of what the right. liberal arts were. That said, uh, you know I think it's up to private institutions, which, of which we have many, and thankfully uh, I'm a part of one at the University of Notre Dame, mm -hmm. in which I think our humanities, you know, I think overall, um, certainly I would not propose their elimination. I actually think there are, we have many, many fine uh, faculty mm -hmm. uh, at institutions like mine uh, who I think are doing a terrific job in exactly that tradition. Mm -hmm. So it's, I, I do, th I, I in many ways, I think that I was responding to an article, I think, written by Roger Kimball, mm -hmm. in which people yeah. in the humanities, I think, need to understand that the course that they have taken, in which they are increasingly hostile, I think, to the basic norms of American society, are going to put what I think is a legitimate and deeply necessary form of learning at risk precisely because they themselves have undermined the very purpose and reason for their existence. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gorin, do you have any closing thoughts on that? I certainly agree with with most of that. With with, with the caveat that, um, well, well, I should I should say a little little biographical info. I, I'm a I'm trained in in the disciplines of uh, philosophy, law, history, and literature. So so I'd be out of a I'd be out of a gig <laughs> if uh, if we did away with humanities. I'm, I'm I was obviously. I was an English major, so uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I know of what I speak as well. <laughs> no, I know, I know. I, I I'm totally sympathetic to your your tweet. That certainly, um, they're not teaching real humanities in really any of those disciplines, unless you go to a very specific subset of institution or classical college. I I would close with the idea that I'm bothered by even in conservative academia as 
diminutive a little niche as we've carved out for ourselves conservatives in the academy Mm -hmm. um that they say i I still don't think they're doing things fully right for instance i know at at the the best of these conservative spots which are straussian hot spots i was at claremont's graduate school for a while before i was a little bit um Mm -hmm. um yeah well I, i won't say that but i was i was at claremont graduate school for a while and i i noticed they only read the federalist papers for instance as opposed to the Federalist Papers in conjunction with the Anti-Federalist Papers. And this, to me, was conspicuous because I'd just left law school and had read the Anti-Federalist Papers. And I think clearly the Anti-Federalists, even though they're they're still making Americanist arguments that I think are valid, I think they won out over the Federalists. So it's it's strange to to, you know, house a debate and only give give voice to one side of the debate. That's one problem even in conservative academia. Mm -hmm. Um, With all that said, yeah, I mean, the original purpose of the university, yet another side, which pretty much with pretty much everything else, libraries, lower schools, you know, clean water, uh, good, right-minded republicanism. The university was a Catholic invention, and it was for the queen of the sciences, which is theology, philosophy, and natural philosophy or mathematics. Mm-hmm. You have to do something in today's system because of science and technology has expanded so rapidly, you do have to opt to do something with the hard sciences, which are more like a very heady sort of trade school. Mm-hmm. But we uh, maybe I don't know, maybe the solution is in more more explicitly uh, altering what, what kind of school are you going to go to a, a true humanities institution, right? In which case it would be a sort of magisterial education, or a or a science one. I, I don't know, I haven't thought about it too much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's that. I mean, a whole another podcast can be dedicated yeah. to that topic. And we tried to cover a lot today. And we thank you both for this edifying dialogue. Again, for our listeners, Professor Deneen's work is why liberalism failed. The Gordon's is Catholic. Republic. We'll put it on the screen, gentlemen. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, for this conversation. Of course, you're always welcome on our show. And have a good day. Thanks very much. Thank you very thank much. You. We thank you for joining us today on another special Right on Point interview. We value your positive and constructive feedback, so please send us an email at rop at rightonpointpodcast.com to voice your concerns and ideas about this show. You can also submit your comments on the contact page of our website, rightonpointpodcast.com. In addition, make sure you subscribe to our show on your platform of choice. We are available on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and many other outlets. Find us on social media. You can follow us on Twitter at ROP Podcast, like us on Facebook at ROP Podcast, and follow us on Instagram at Right on Point Podcast to participate in exclusive polls and view other great content. When truth telling has become a revolutionary act, we thank you again for tuning in to the podcast that is committed to delivering it right to you. Until next time, I'm Olivia Ingracia. And I'm Paul Ingracia. So long and God bless. <laughs>